The, the first thing I always say to a Turkish audience is, I am sorry about my voice. Um, the, it's, it's, it's obviously not American, and it's not English. What it is, is obsolete Scottish. <laughs> there, there was a time when Scotland was a civilized country, easily within living memory, and educated Scots spoke like me. But it's sometimes a little difficult for a Turkish audience to follow, and I can only say, just be patient. Um, it'll be all right. Um, the second thing is, I hope you'll forgive me, but the subject I'm going to talk about, which is uh, these Germans who arrived here in the 30s, is really just a collection of stories. Um, it is impossible to put any kind of structure on it. Uh, and I'm not very good at theory either. Um, I think it's a species of German crime against humanity. Um, so I will try to be, uh, I hope, intelligently anecdotal, but it's bound to be anecdotal. And, it'll, and I'll start, oh, first of all, how long would you like to talk for? Keep an eye on this. Uh, uh, less than an hour. <laughs> since, um, since I've promised um, anecdote, I might as well start um, autobiographically. I came here in 1995 and uh, um, got around Ankara, which was in those days quite a small place. And one would meet old ladies who would, it was still those days, who would speak French and would say after a bit, avez-vous connu Reuter? And uh, I would sort of say, well, not really, no. I didn't know anything about Turkey at the time. And so they would pass. And then I started hearing more about Reuter and his exploits. And I might as well start with him because he is, in a way, the great glory of the Republic. Let me uh, put it this way. Working class boy, Magdeburg, I think, um, was a prisoner of war in Russia in the First World War. I think he was in Kazakhstan because he knew something about Turkish languages. He became a communist. A lot of German prisoners of war did became a communist member of the Reichstag, very young man, he got sick of Moscow, set up an independent communist party, got sick of that, and became a social democrat and Lord Mayor of Magdeburg. Hitler put him in a camp, and uh, the English Quakers got him out, and sent him in 35 or 36 to a job which was just opening up then in Ankara, um, where he was professor of town planning. Now, the thing about Reuter was, he could pick up Turkish like that. I suppose he must have learned it in the train, or something like that, because they put him on the Turkish Language Reform Commission. And, uh, I mean, this man must have had a tremendous presence, but he is really remembered in Ankara, or was, for being a tremendous womanizer. <laughs> there, was one, there was one scandal after another in Bachelet, which was the, the Amy Grace Quarters. Now, he, um, in, he kept his contacts with the German Social Democrats, and in for, late 46, I think, maybe a little later, he went back to Hanover and then to Berlin and became the mayor of West Berlin at the time of the Stalin blockade. Became a very famous fellow. He would have succeeded Willy Brandt. Oh, he, he would have been Willy Brandt, only um, he died quite early in 1953. I don't quite know why, but quite a life. Now that was my introduction to this um, to this whole subject, and I heard that I had been in Istanbul and Ankara. Some very, very remarkable Germans indeed. And there are indeed, I, some of this must be familiar to you, but there are indeed some um, some very good books indeed, moving books on the subject. Um, I think my favourite, with considerable competition, was a man called Fritz Neumark, who, um, who uh, you know, he was like so many Jews in Germany. He wasn't a Jew in any meaningful way at all. He had married a non-Jewish wife who remained entirely loyal to him. And he was 
a talented professor of accountancy, I think, in Frankfurt. And he wrote his memoirs uh, describing what it was like to be chased out of Germany by Hitler with people you had assumed in your university would sympathize with you and find him that they, cut, they ignored him, they cut him, uh, when he, you know, more or less on the 1st of April, 1933, when Hitler proclaimed the boycott of the Jews and the sacking of Jews from official jobs. He said it was a shocking performance on the part of people he thought were good liberals. He said the only one who helped him was a German conservative, a man of religious principle, who came up to him and said, I have a bank account in Switzerland, Here's the number. He said he recognized the quality of that man. Now he arrives. And what must it have been like as your ship comes round the Sarajevo? You see the old Istanbul skyline, that wonderful green of Istanbul that it was in those days. You land in Karakoy, you have your Kurdish Hamal taking your bags up the street of steps, and you go to the Park Hotel. Really, I mean, I hope the Turkish Cultural Association will restore that hotel and blow up that car park. <laughs> it's an international scandal. You should appeal for funds from UNESCO to blow it up in the name of the, this year of culture. Now, you arrive in the Park Hotel, Grand Hotel, as in the old days. You go to an Armenian tailor and he runs you up a white tie in three days. And then you are taken to meet the Minister of Education, Rashid Talib, in company, I think, with Einstein. And Einstein was here. Uh, and Rashid Talib had said that they had appointed him Professor of Theoretical Physics. And there was a rather surreal conversation. I think Einstein at the end, at that time, really felt he had nothing to say. And you know, I have to say, I agree with them. Um, and they said, no, when will your seminar be, Professor? He said, I'm not teaching. So we went to Princeton instead. They got somebody else, a man called Hans Eichenbach, who was another of these geniuses who, in his spare time, tutored the Turkish ski team. Now, you arrive at a reception in the Park Hotel, Rashid Gallup, the Republican establishment, you meet Ataturk. And he said, he's very good on Ataturk. He said, you know, you meet this man, you remember every second of the five minutes that you talk to him. And uh, they were all very, very loyal, of course, to the Republican, call it ideology, if you like. And a curious thing, when Ataturk died, uh, the professors were just after the army in the funeral procession. I suppose the ambassadors must have gone before, but the professors were very high up in the in the queue and um, in the procession. <coughs> and <coughs> so of course they're made to feel very much at home. They were actually paid more than a judge. So they live well until the inflation started later on. They're very much part of the Republican establishment, and in those days, they, um, they obviously knew very well how to get the best out of those foreigners. I sometimes think, you know, when Turkey is in a creative state, as it obviously is with people with like Mehmet Fatih and Ataturk and Mahmoud II, I think, and even if you allow me to say this, Abdul Hamid, mm -hmm. uh, when it's in a creative state, it uses its foreigners properly. When it's not in a creative state, as in, shall we say, the 1950s, uh, it doesn't get it doesn't get the best foreigners, and it doesn't get the best out of them. I would like to say, I think, from my own experience, Turkey is in quite a creative phase at the moment. Uh, ever since I've been here, and it's now only 15 years, I've felt entirely at home. Problems, obviously, but it's fun and interesting. Now, let me get back to some figures on it. Hitler had uh, said no Jews in universities. So in the summer of 1933, the Jews by and large lost their jobs. And uh, the English were very good 
at, at uh, taking academic genes in. We did, uh, we did incredibly well at it. But I think it's safe to say that the, the quality of the emigration in Turkey was uh, higher than anywhere else. And let me, uh, let me just talk a bit about the background. Now here, um, I'm wandering on slightly thin ice, because although I have read quite a lot of the literature on the, the subject, there are certain aspects of the, uh, the Atatürk period of the late 1920s which are quite difficult for a foreigner, uh, you know, from inside to understand. Um, from, what, from what I've read about it, and it has to be said that what I've read is entirely Atatürkist and Republican, uh, when the alphabet reform came about in 1928, there was a lot of resistance to it on the part of, well, I don't need to tell you. And some of that resistance was concentrated in the university, the old Darun Funun, which went back, I think, to the 1860s, mm -hmm. isn't it? Something like that. Mm -hmm. And so people like um, Fuat Tabru would, uh, would resist these, the alphabet change and say that it is a crime to do this to a literature as grand as ours, leaving aside the religious side and leaving aside the other business where uh, I fully understand uh, their problems. You would probably agree with me that the reform of the language now has gone too far in the sense that uh, you will find words which no one knows now unless they're absolutely educated. You will find uh, words which I read, I, mean, I, I try to read it as much as I can, I read and then try and then use innocently, thinking that they'll be understood. And <laughs> the point in which I realized quite how difficult the reform of the vocabulary had been was quite early on in Ankara, we were going to the airport in a taxi and there was some demonstration or other. And, um, uh, and I said to the taxi driver, who be Tezahur, Baldun, Tazavur, and Ebelimis. I mean, that with a Scottish accent. <laughs> the man must have thought I was talking about Canadian. Now, uh, I have to say this because, in a way, one can understand both why the Republic responded to that old university as it did and why there was so much opposition. Apparently the conservatives in the university did resist the alphabet change and this kind of the whole trend of things in that period. I believe it's true that in 1930, if you turned on the radio, you heard only Western classical music for three or four years. I believe it's true, but it's hearsay. Now, uh, these, um, how do you deal with universities? universities reforms. It may be said that all universities are, are unhappy in the same way. Uh, the, the dons are lazy, the students don't learn anything, there are no books. Uh, the catalogue of the university, this is another of my German stories, the catalogue of the university apparently was kept by a little old man of a religious disposition who would receive a book, would scribble something on a piece of paper and put it in a drawer. So that was the catalogue of the library. Along came another of my special Germans, um, Helmut Wetter, who was not a Jew, uh, probably, if anything, vaguely anti-Semitic. He, he was from a, a very stiff-necked conservative family from Hesse. And his brother was an awful pain in the neck, nationalist historian called Gerhard Wetter. Uh, for whom Germany could do no wrong. It was the Allies who caused it. Did you say Ritter? Ritter, yeah. What? Helmut Ritter. I know. You, you, no. Now, um, Helmut Ritter had been, he was genius. He had been uh, in German intelligence in the First World War, had interpreted for Saint and Falkenheim, and I suppose Persian and Arabic and Ottoman and Kurdish, I don't know what. Uh, he was genius on that level. 
went back to Hamburg at the end of the war, and there was an interesting place then, the Orient Institute, which was run by a, a man who became the Prussian Minister of Education, Karl Becker, the author of one of the great lines about the entire history of this area, when he says, no Alexander, no Marinette. Now, this man was in charge of the institute and got Ritter uh, promoted. And then Ritter, in 1926, was expelled. Uh, he was expelled for homosexuality. Now, those of us who know something about Hamburg and homosexuality in 1926 must think that the homosexuality must have been very bad for him to be expelled. So he was expelled. And he arrived without a penny in Istanbul uh, with his cello and teamed up with another of these Central European geniuses who taught the violin here, Liko Amar, who was a Hungarian. And the four of them used to run a string quartet in Ankara Station. Um, and uh, he was neglected for a bit. And then, being a clever man, writing about Sufi music, he was appointed librarian of Istanbul University where he made himself very, very unpopular, the way librarians can make themselves very, very unpopular. <laughs> and he was, he was sort of four-dimensionally efficient in that irritating German way. <laughs> but still, you know, if, if Istanbul University has a good library, thank you, Helmut Ritter. <laughs> um, he was hated. Um, I knew Jeffrey Lewis, the great expert on Turkey, Turkish, towards the end of his life. And, I asked him, what about Helmut Ritter? Jeffrey Lewis, with an incredibly generous-minded man, said, not a nice man. <laughs> uh, he he, he uh, scorned me so, uh, so badly. Did he? Uh, he well. treated me so badly several times, but I never, I, mean, I said, this is an old professor. <laughs> so I couldn't pay attention and I followed him. Yes. <laughs> Well, um, we've had our revenge. <laughs> his, brother, his brother was an awful pain in the neck. Uh, Gerhard Ritter. Might talk a bit more about him. Anyway, poor old Helmut Ritter. He, he uh, became professor of Orientalistic in the university. Yes. And then they sacked him in 1948. Uh, and he went back to the Munich, I think. And, uh, I can't remember all these facts. I think he went, and then, then the Germans paid for him to come back here. There was a return for a time. <laughs> uh, and I think he died here. I think. Probably. Of all peculiarities. So many people. Uh, so many Germans. Of all peculiarities. You know, in Boisage University, there is a very bad girl indeed who has managed to get hold of the love letters of Helmut Ritter to drug up folks. <laughs> Oops, she showed them to me. They are an embarrassment beyond embarrassment. <laughs> I also remember Professor yeah. Now, um, the, 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 um, the resistance in the university seems to have been so great that uh, Reshid Ghalib and uh, Hassan Ali Jal, people like that, all said the only answer to it is close the place down. So they commissioned a report from a Swiss, a man called Marsh, Marsh, I'm not sure it's pronounced Marsh, Marsh, or Marsh. And he said all the things that one says about universities that don't work. They've been said, I should think, since the days of the university in Haran in the southeast. And um, they took that opportunity to sack more or less everybody. Um, and uh, now, for this to happen in, in, in any country with a serious literature and academic tradition uh, is of course a drastic thing to do. It is a it is a revolutionary step. And I know that I know from talking to some people how much it was resented. Fuat Kirkland, for instance, was a very serious historian. There was no reason whatsoever to get rid of him. Then there's the other big case was Zeki Valde Dogan, who had set up a department of Turkology in the university and had got a lot of very bright Central Asians around him. The tenor of the thing is obviously Turkish nationalist. And uh, I don't quite know the circumstances because um, that particular, he's not quite frank in his memoirs about it. 
No, he was sacked and found his way to If you could understand her Turkish. What? If he, you could understand <laughs> his Turkish. I remember Russian. He, he, he was very difficult to understand. Was he? Yes. Very difficult. <laughs> um, now, <clears throat> he found his way to exile, uh, this time in Dolphus in Austria, because the old Habsburg Diplomatic Academy was still functioning, and uh, in the Bergkasse, I think it is. And they had a flat there, and they looked after him, because they were still interested in Central Asia, and Zeki Valadit Dogan was the expert. So they installed him in the flat, which was Bergkasse 19, stroke three, five. Um, the inhabitant of Bergkasse 19, stroke three, was Professor Dr. Freud. Um, <laughs> now, poor old Zeki Valadit Dogan was lonely. He had no money. It was cold. He wrapped himself in a great goose bed for a coat and boots, and stomped up and down on the carpetless floor, declaiming goose bed poetry in a loud voice. Underneath, there is Professor Dr. Freud. He tell me that you how fast you say your father dressed as a wolf, ripped you in the forest. Thump, thump, thump. And they used to have terrible rows, apparently. And he went on to Germany and must have fiddled about with the Nazis up to a point he doesn't see. But he, he was prudent enough to go back to Turkey and, uh, without compromising himself, where I think he was put in prison for a bit. No, these are these are serious people, no doubt in the Darul Funun. There were some unserious people. People who were just lazy and un 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 unreconstructed. But they were all sacked, except for two or three of the doctors who stayed on. Now then uh, there's a great stroke of, as it were, luck. Just at the time this is happening, in January nineteen thirty three. Adolf Hitler becomes a uh, Führer and whatnot. And there is then this, uh, these hundreds of bright people <coughs> leaving Germany. Now, I can't think of one who would, who would have looked in the mirror and said, I'm a Jew. Not in any meaningful sense. There was a very good, well chosen, in the uh, exhibition of all this in Berlin. I've got the catalogue. And there they all are. There's Hans Reichenbach teaching the Turkish ski team. There is, what was he called, the famous doctor uh, Hirsch, with another doctor called Nissen. They used to go into the villages to tell the peasants about hygiene for no money. They just did it. Uh, there's Neumark. There is, uh, there is, um, well, I'll come on to the names. Uh, uh, they're all doing good in the place. And uh, wonderfully chosen photographs, excellent essay on the whole thing. And what do they call it? Heimat loans in Yiddish. Now look, the idea that Professor Dr. Reichenbach would have anything to do with Yiddish. They were all terribly good Germans. They were very cultivated people, good musicians, everything. It has this stupid title, but don't be put off by the title. It is a it is a it is it is a catalogue well worth reading. I've learned a, a lot from it. <coughs> now they arrive and they are invited to set up faculties and to train Turkish graduate students. The um, the obvious things in that period are medicine and law. Uh, these are the things which which uh, were taken immensely seriously, and there were some obviously first-rate doctors who have never been forgotten by the students of the students of the students. These doctors, um, they, uh, the um, the other side, the other side that was very important, and which again must be a huge creative step for the republic, is law. <coughs> And if you think how um, difficult it is to adapt to the sort of customary law, some of it sanctioned by the chariot, I mean the, the polygamy for instance, or certain property rights, things of this sort, 
which are anchored in popular consciousness, which in the provinces are upheld as a matter of course, and still in a way are. And onto that you put a corpus of foreign law. I think it was the German property law, for instance. And I'm told, you might know about this, um, the, I'm told that the, the, the Germans reformed their law and the Turks didn't. So what you are operating under here now is, a, is an obsolete form of German property law going back to the 1890s, but the past. They, uh, they got some, uh, again, obviously immensely inspired people to teach the law. The best of them was, well, when I say best, the competition is enormous. Um, it was um, Hirsch, the other Hirsch. I forget his name. It'll come back. Schwarz. Uh, what? Schwarz, Professor Schwarz. No, no, no Hirsch. He, it was yes. Ernst Hirsch, Ernst Hirsch. It was again another of these, um, these careers. Uh, professor of jurisprudence in Berlin, chased out by Hitler, and set up the, the law faculty in Istanbul University. Uh, they also put him on the language reform because he seems to have learned legal Turkish, which defeats me. He seems to have learned legal Turkish on the boat. At any rate, in 1936 or 37, to indicate that uh, the new university was up and running, they invited the diplomatic corps, everybody, vice chancellors from everywhere, to come and see the new university as it was set up, and I suppose the, the Asset yeah, made it. And uh, they chose Hirsch to do the lecture on the setting up of the law faculty. And he gave a lecture which must have been extremely learned, elegantly delivered, uh, probably in Turkish. Uh, and he went through the difficulties of introducing criminal law, which I think was Italian. Some form of Swiss law was used for something, German property law, he knew it all. And uh, he gave his lecture, and at the end of it, the last five minutes, he said, um, the one thing I must say in all of this is that if you are going to uh, translate the laws of one country into the practice of another, you must get them properly translated. And he said, unfortunately, it has not been the case that these foreign laws have been well translated into Turkish. And he gave lists of inaccuracies. Who was the translator? The rector. Now, uh, he said that he knew what he was doing. The rector would not send him back to Buchenwald camp. But he said life was very uncomfortable. And I think he, he eventually transferred to Ankara. And then there was another of these these um, funny problems uh, that, that, you know, happen. And uh, they said to him, we can't give you a professorship unless you take Turkish citizenship. And that was difficult. Uh, however, he took his Turkish citizenship all right, and they cut his salary in half. <laughs> 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 that must have been the re director's revenge, something like that. <laughs> now, <coughs> we're, we're talking about the setting up of an Istanbul University, with, with, which must have been, in those days, I think you could, you could um, easily say it was the best German university, um, but you could even, you know, there would be a case for saying that it was the best university in the world at the time. Um, probably an exaggeration, but you see, what, you see what I mean. And the publications that they came up with are, uh, you know, again, full of thoughts. Because they didn't die mentally because they were exiled. They are able to get all the books they want. They are keeping very good company. They like their graduate students. They feel wanted, which is the key to this, oh. so much in this life. And they are used by the state in a very sensible way. Now, uh, I happen to feel uh, that there was one thing done uh, at that time which uh, we should reintroduce. Um, I, I always, you know, it would be difficult for me to teach in Turkish, but if, if, it, if it had been required, 
as part of my contract. <coughs> I think I would have tried to do it. And these, these professors were required to teach in Turkish after three years, which is quite a generous time. Now, of course, it is, um, it, 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 is, um, it is ferociously difficult for some foreigners to do it. Some could. Some, I think it's the left-hand side of the brain, couldn't. Um, now, the, the, the saddest case in this was a man called Wilhelm Röpke, who was not a Jew, as it happens, nor even a socialist. He was just an honest man who couldn't stand the Nazis, and who said, I'm not staying here. And he came to Istanbul as professor of something in economics, I'm not quite sure what. And he had to sign his contract saying, I will learn Turkish after three years, maybe five. It was quite generous. And the, he understood it. And then the poor man, they all lived in Kadikoy. The poor man living in his flat in Kadikoy, trying to learn Turkish. <laughs> I had a, a very friendly relations in Bill Kent with an elderly, quite distinguished economist called Sidney Afriat. And poor old Sidney managed to learn uh, one word of Turkish every year. <laughs> <laughs> he just couldn't do it. And I said, said he, he, he was a man of, of you know, considerable stature in beard and looked like a, a wood carving. Um, and uh, I said, Sidney, look, um, repeat after me. All you need to do is just not that dignified head of yours and say from time to time, Benje York. <laughs> he couldn't even do that. No, uh, poor old Rutger went, uh, had to leave. And um, he went to the University of Basel, uh, together with Ludwig von Mises, who was, um, Richard von Mises, who was Ludwig's brother, who also couldn't do Turkish. <coughs> they went there. And then in 1946, or seven, must have been 47, uh, on the line comes Chancellor Adenauer or to be Chancellor Rappenauer, with the backing of, of, uh, of the Americans. And Adenauer more or less said to him, I would like you to be the maker of the German economic miracle. And that's really what it is. Everyone talks about Ludwig Erhard, but the intellectual underpinning of it is Röpke. He thought it through. You know, uh, it's all very well saying free market and whatnot, but if you have a free market without the social and moral underpinnings, the sort of basic honesty and basic stability that you need, then your free market is simply going to become acts of piracy and dishonesty. And Röpke had thought this sort of thing through. And then in 1949, they had their constitutional convention. Now, the, uh, the German constitution is, I think, after the American one, though perhaps I shouldn't say that, <laughs> The German constitution is, as modern constitutions go, an admirable document. In the first place, it's short. Um, and on the whole, the shorter the constitution, the longer its life. The military coup people in 1961 made a terrible mistake of producing a constitution that's this size. And it lasted, what, 10 years? <laughs> uh, next time, make it short. There shall be a country called Turkey. Uh, its language will be Turkish. Uh, that's it. Now, it wasn't just Rusto who sat on that constitutional con uh, convention. There was another interesting man called Alexander Rusto, also not a Jew. <coughs> I also just an honest man. He had, in the days of Weimar, been, um, been the secretary of the Small Business Federation. And you know, the small businesses hated the big banks and cartels because they were in league with the trade unions to strangle small business and to stop the competition. So if you were a small businessman in Weimar, you were swimming in regulations and having to avoid tax all the time. And the natural consequence of that is the 8 million unemployed on the basis of which it took into power. So when Risto arrived in Istanbul, was a professor of philosophy, he had some thoughts, and he wrote a book which I must say I haven't read, which related antiquity to the present, 
but he's somebody who knew his law, his history, his languages, his aesthetics, everything. And uh, they put him on the German Constitutional Convention. <clears throat> People like that, sitting in that drafty schoolroom in Bonn, come up with a constitution which seems to me to be, still to be, well, quite admirable. It says things like this, that you must not tax a father of a family to the point at which mothers of small children need to go out to work. Well, sort of, I'm into that if you see the consequences of what goes wrong in England, where mothers of tiny children have to dump their children and then take some meaningless job in a supermarket checkout because of the tax system. Now, <coughs> uh, Rousteau. And so far I think I've painted a very optimistic, glowing picture. It's not that easy. Uh, first of all, you know, the Turkish state in those days was, after all, a, you know, it was a sort of police state. If you wanted to go from Ankara to Istanbul on that splendid night train, you needed to go to the police, the Emirate, I suppose, and get permission to do it. You know, with all the business of people mm -hmm. typing out triplicates and carbon paper and so on, and double signatures for this, that, they are all that nonsense. <coughs> So, yeah, from that point of view, it's not that easy. Now, there's a side to this that I don't know. Um, from the Turks I've spoken to, the, um, the way in which these German professors are remembered is glowingly positive. They think very, very highly of them. Now, there is another side to it. Uh, how would one feel, as a Turk, with all these foreigners, some of them massacring the language, if at all, uh, perhaps being in some cases very arrogant and dogmatic, that's another subject altogether, telling the Turks how to do things, and really in the end saying, we are here because you need to be taught. And <clears throat> I would guess that there was a big Turkish reaction against them, under the surface, in the days when you had people like Reshid Ghalib and Hassan Ali Ujjab in the Ministry of Education, that would be one thing. They would understand. <clears throat> but then, round about, is it 35, when Fezzi Chakpak starts appearing, mm -hmm. and Ataturk was beginning to lose control of things, and still more, I suspect, Jalal Bayar. Uh, there, there is, under the surface, what are we doing with these people here? Now, they didn't do anything during the Second World War. In fact, they were very good in, in, uh, in, in giving the professors absolute safety against being sent back to Nazi Germany, <coughs> which Papen tried to do on occasion. And, uh, but the, the reaction against them starts, I think, with Inanu in about 47 or 48, when um, life just becomes a little bit difficult for them probably with, you know, administrative things of one sort or another, that university bodies can play very well. <clears throat> and then the other thing, of course, was that the inflation in Turkey um, had, uh, was such that their salaries didn't go very far. So they start trickling away. Um, Ritter in 48 was eased out. Then Neumark left in, I think, something like 1950 and became rector of Hamburg Frankfurt. Ernst Hirsch left around the same time and became the rector of the Free University in Berlin. It's all, it's all success stories all over the place. Hans Reichenbach went to Berkeley um, and so on and so forth. And the, the big ones who were mobile, and a lot of them were very big, in the event start going in the late 40s and the early 50s. Gilbert Ortile is very bitter about what happened in Ankara University because he said it got a dean who decided he wanted rid of all those Germans and who also said, let's get rid of all these Ottoman books in the library. Who wants them? I'm not sure if, uh, if I remember him correctly, but I think that's what he said. So they, uh, they drift off, uh, some of them remaining. And f for my sins, uh, I was, uh, I was a bit of an idiot 
There was a woman called Frau Pretorius, even in the middle 90s when I was around, who had been the wife of the intendant of the, the theatre in Ankara, and who had originally been the intendant of Weimar and Berlin in the great days of expressionist plays. And this old lady was still around. I could have gone and talked to her. It was silly, it was stupid of me. But I didn't realize at the time the importance of the subject. And there were one or two other survivors of that sort still there. <coughs> me who still be. I don't know. At any rate, they started the way. There was one, my favorite really, of them all, was, uh, I keep forgetting the name. It will come back. He again is a product of Buchenwald, social democrat of a fairly moderate type. Came to uh, Ankara as first professor of sociology. Uh, loved the place. His wife left him with the two daughters and went back to Germany. They weren't Jews. Uh, the two sons stayed loyal to the father, and they stayed on in Bachelor, I suppose. And uh, the sons grew up and uh, became bilingual in Turkish, I suppose, a Polak kind of thing. And then he, he had a big house, and he used simply to give rooms to poor students. And he's remembered immensely fondly because of this. Now, he went back as rector of Hamburg University, and uh, has left, I think, the, I've seen the book, it's in Turkish, it's uh, you know, an account of sociology. <coughs> but he wanted to come back to Turkey. He didn't like Hamburg, you know, all that fish, all that wind, uh, all those German voices. He missed Turkey. So uh, eventually in 56 or 57, the Americans set up the Atatürk University in Erzurum. And uh, our man, Kirchner, it will come back. Our man applied hard with his friends in Turkey, well, I suppose his ex-students, to come back. And uh, <coughs> he was appointed deputy rector. Now, by then, you had to be a Turkish citizen to, uh, to do this. But there was a ceremony, president of the republic, champagne, tears running down faces, long speeches, Mechter band or whatever, um, and striking up. And he made a long speech saying, it had been the time of the time of his life, the time that his land of it, and it is a few of got it. Um, and he did a long speech to that effect. And the administration then cut his salary in half as well. <laughs> but he, he stayed on in Erzurum. I know Erzurum quite well. I mean, it seems unimaginable of somebody like that to be ending up there. but. Um, it was a country in those days with, uh, with such a, a splendidly open frontier. Now, <coughs> uh, I, I might as well, uh, I think, shall I conclude my remarks? Um, uh, I always admire Turkish audiences, you know, because uh, my students sit there incredibly patiently, <laughs> listening to me going on, sometimes for two hours. And uh, I admire my Turkish audiences it is for showing up, up that. To the speaker. That kind of patience. But, um, uh, I might uh, just wind up my remarks by, by saying that uh, for quite a long time now I've, I've been thinking we ought to have a book, a proper book, about foreigners in Turkey. It's been, it is an enormous theme. But they've been here more or less since the start. I mean, if you think that the man who designed the gun that broke down the walls of Constantinople on the 28th of May was, was originally a Hungarian, one Urban. Uh, and there have been foreigners of various sorts in, in on, uh, Turkey in a most remarkable way since uh, the beginning. Some convert. I would like to know how far the conversions of those Hungarians and Poles in the 19th century went. Interesting to know. Then there's the differences of the various sorts of foreigners that uh, you get here. At any rate, it is an absolutely gigantic subject. I think nowadays so big that, it, that uh, you know, as the Germans would say, it's uferlos. It doesn't have riverbanks.
But you could do it up to about 1940, I think, with my Germans. And I'm starting thinking about that book, and I'm starting to assemble stuff, stuff for a general book on these things. So wish me well. Thank you.